Chapter 15, March 1980. One year later, I no longer make the bread or do the dishes. Karen does all that. She arrived on the Munchkin House doorstep, having driven straight here from Cambridge, and doesn't know what's next. I am glad to see her after so long, glad to shelter a member of my original women's group from the late 60s. I offer Karen this deal. You do all the cooking and the housework and buy all the food and you can turn the upstairs attic into a little apartment for yourself. She agrees to it. I've got myself a wife. Sometimes I joke with her, call her that. She doesn't like it one bit, doesn't like it any better than I did with Dick. I am not doing the dishes. I am not engaged in any of the usual daily rituals. I am treating myself and being treated by others as a special case, an exception, due to the great success of the continuing open space experiment and my status as its visionary founder. I feel special, superior to the others, see myself as their teacher, leader, Glory in being the center of their attention, how they listen carefully to what I say, keying off my moods, looking at me for guidance. I feel isolated, lonely, am gradually and insidiously losing my center without realizing it. No longer do I move from within the core of my being, that deep inner resourcefulness which created and sustained the beginnings of this wonderful and magical experiment, more and more, I seem to be living on the surface, catching reflections, trying to live up to images others have of me. I am entering a long, dark night of the soul. My vast stubbornness, that same quality which enabled me from an unusually early age to make long-range goals and stick to them, is now showing its dark face, and not for the first time. Although I don't realize this either, because I am so fixed and so unconscious in my habits, the lesson the first time around was delivered with a mighty blow to pride. I got fired. And since I failed to pick up on the deeper meaning of that time, the attitudes in me which made the firing necessary, I am now preparing myself again, unconsciously, to repeat the process, to repeat the lesson by receiving an even more devastating blow the second time around. In both cases, the clues are all there all along. Subtle hints, signs which, were I to pay attention to them and correct my course accordingly, I could avoid the coming disaster. Unfortunately, I am too stubborn, too proud, and unyielding in my dogmatic idealism to pick up on them. I refuse to acknowledge the intuitive flashes streaking through the blackness. They light up the night, brilliant. For a single second all is illumined, and then nothing, nothing. Thank God for nothing. Don't want to know. Don't want to see. Don't want to change. Don't want to have to admit. Don't want these flashes of my one year as a college teacher. How then, too, I was lauded in the beginning for my vision of each student as a unique individual and the entire school as a sacred community, only to gradually begin to feel this same sense of eerie isolation from those whom I had informed of that vision and who now insist I live up to the trust they place in me, to see our full potential, to see it for them, to be responsible for them. A sense of exhaustion creeps in from hanging on to their image of me, from having to watch myself so that I continue to be who they want me to be, have to keep myself in line, be strict, don't let them see who I really am. If only they knew, if only they could see inside their shining leader this burnt out, lifeless shell. No, no, don't think about that, just keep going. Keep on doing what you're doing. Get another issue out. Keep on opening up space. Show this smug little community that it can open up to a larger sense of itself. All well and good, but are you allowing the space within you to open? Eh? Are you even acknowledging what lives within you? How constricted it feels? How much it wants to burst out? To just say, oh, to hell with you all, just leave me alone? The flashing again. This time quick. 
cutting questions, comments. No, push it away. It's not there. It never happened. Don't think, just do. No longer move from within the depths of myself. Can't seem to get down there. Get caught up in the little things. Every little thing bothers me. Restless, scattered, longing. Longing for love. My intimate relationship with the doctor is over, though his financial support continues. Irritable, bored. Now what? What next? I begin to attract men to myself, strangers. Each time, after one date or two, I sense he's alcoholic. Throw him out. Look for another. Chapter 16, September 1980. Six months later, doing the dishes at a tiny plastic sink in a 20-foot trailer in a trailer park deep in the dark heart of a tangled old eucalyptus forest 50 miles south of Bakersfield, California. Washing out the stained, mismatched, chipped cups, the flimsy, dented aluminum plates feel weird, numb. Feel like I dropped off the world and landed in hell. How embarrassing. If my followers could only see their shining leader now. Going off with Phil was the last thing they expected. He looked so scruffy, so down and out. I'm the only one who really knows him, knows his potential. Pisses me off that they can't see it. I can just see them shaking their heads in dismay, worried about me, judging me. To hell with them. I'll show them. This is a weird place. Scruffy people, paranoid. Some of them, including Phil, think the forest is haunted, that there's some black evil force out there. Twice now I've seen police crews slowly through the park, stop at a trailer, knock on the door, go inside, and then minutes later re-emerge, leading someone, head down and handcuffed, out to the patrol car. Phil wanted to come here. Why? Why does he like it here? Today I'm alone again, thank God. Phil is in the hospital again. The usual liver trouble. Bleeding ulcers. Esophageal varicosities. The doctor tells me he's alcoholic, but I don't believe him. My father told me he was alcoholic too. He was the doctor on call in the emergency room several times in Idaho when Phil was brought in. My father doesn't like him at all. Says he doesn't trust him. Says Phil lies. Says he tried to order him around. Acted like he knew better what he needed than the doctor. Dad's so controlling and judgmental. Serves him right to be faced with someone as strong as Phil. Phil is not alcoholic. He says he isn't, and I believe him. He says he isn't, says so in that weird, casual way of his. Weird, the way he says it makes me want to ask him again, to make sure. Can I really believe him? Of course I can. Why wouldn't I? Looking for clues in his behavior, in the way his body acts. Like at dinner last night, when once again I got up the nerve to ask him the question. Had to wait until I was feeling strong, sure of myself. Had to wait until I could act like the question was no big deal. Don't want him to think I'm prying or that I don't trust him. But the way he answered was weird. Me? An alky? He drawled, glancing up at me, grinning, casually flicking the ash off his camel cigarette. Pausing, still grinning, he considered his cigarette, rolling it between his fingers, as if harboring a secret joke and then laughed, that funny, mirthless laugh with his head cocked to one side and his shoulders going up and down. I want to ask him again, always want to ask him again, want a connection with him, want to, him to be there, but it's hard, weird. How can I know he's telling the truth? I hate to ask in case he isn't. Sometimes I do feel strong enough to pretend to be as casual as he seems to be, and then I can just ask it. Just slip it out, no big deal. But usually I just can't seem to get the words out, even though it's the only thing on my mind. Can't think of anything else. Want to know, 
want to be able to trust him, want to establish that at least so that maybe we can go on. But the words, they stick in my throat because I never know how he's going to act. Sometimes he's casual, offhand, like last night. Other times, especially lately, he's been getting mean, furious, and I can't ever tell from how he is before I ask who he will be in response. It's as if there's no connection between who he seems to be one moment and what he will do the next. Oh, I shouldn't ask. Just don't ask. Can't blame him for getting mad at me. I should trust him. Why don't I trust him? I've no reason not to trust him. I've never even seen him take a drink. Anytime someone offers him one, he refuses. Isn't that proof enough? So why do I keep bringing it up? Need to stop talking about this. Don't want to upset him more. Yesterday morning, when he stumbled out of the trailer for his first cigarette of the day, the dog must have been in his way. He kicked him. I guess he must have kicked him, though I didn't see it, because the dog started to whimper and scuttled under the table, and when Phil gets mad, his ulcer starts acting up. Got to prevent him from getting mad. Set up this place differently so he can move more smoothly through it. Make it easier on him. Ambulance picked him up yesterday afternoon. He'd been throwing up in the tiny bathroom. Wouldn't let me see. Came out looking haunted, drawn, like the blood had been drawn out of him. His usual jaundiced complexion underlined a chalky gray. I managed to get the old truck going, followed behind the ambulance into town. God, what he's been through. Black Beret. Killed people with his bare hands. Knows so much the government still takes care of him many years later. What does he know? Why won't he tell me? Thank God for VA hospitals. Seven units of blood this time. The usual progression. Ambulance to emergency room to intensive care. The doctor. How I hate him. He found me in the canteen and escorted me to his office. Sat me down and told me Phil was alcoholic. No, he's not. I insisted. Yes, he is, he shot back, tears in his eyes. Don't you know alcoholics are pathological liars? I know because my own father was one. Boy, I showed that doctor. Keeping my dignity intact, I just got up and walked out of the room. I dry the dishes and put them away, glad for this little daily routine, for having my hands in hot water, wiping off the tiny counters. Cleaning the place up helps anchor me to reality. Reality? What reality? This is reality? I don't belong here. Can't believe how I got here. Got to get out of here. But no, no, can't leave Phil like this. He's too sick, needs me too much. I can help him. I can save him. If he'll just listen to what I say, take me seriously. I can't leave. What if he hunts me down, finds me later? Go out for my daily walk with the dog into the haunted forest. Weird, my jaw seems to be seizing up, like I can't open my mouth very far before it hurts. Hurts when I try to talk, but I can still think. Think about Phil. If only he would change his attitudes, his values. If only he would open up to me, follow my guidance. I know I could help him. Make him better. Stop the bleeding. And I know it's worth it, no matter how hard. For once in a while, there's confirmation. Once in a while, I get jolted. A swift, clear sense of his soul, his essence, flashing through his eyes like a beacon. But then, as swiftly as it arrives, it disappears, gone out like a light. And there he is again, across from me, glancing covertly out of those shifty dead eyes. They don't look at me. They look everywhere but into my own. But his soul did flash out for that one second. For that one shining moment, Phil was himself, the sacred fullness of the man he could have become, the man he could still be, if only, if only... I know I can help him recover his true being. I just know I can. That Holy Spirit inside him, so long denied, so utterly lost to him that he doesn't even know it's gone. 
the poor man, how he must suffer, got to help him, make him better. He isn't alcoholic. He can't be. If he were, I'd have it figured out by now. I've never even seen him take a drink. Got to get out of here. Can't leave him. Want to scream. Can't scream. Chapter 17, November 1981. I do the dishes here every night, lots of them, in the sink piled high, the cereal bowls, coffee cups, milk and juice glasses from this morning's breakfast, last night's bedtime snacks, littering the counters, the crumbs, little plates and half-full glasses from teenage after-school snacks, balanced precariously on top of everything else, the dirty dinner dishes, dirty pots and pans stacked on the stove. I do them all, every night. It's the least I can do to thank Dick and his new wife, Judy, and her three children for sheltering me during this time when I'm totally exhausted, unnerved by the events of the past year, and utterly devoid of financial or other resources of any kind. Except for the car. Thank God for the car. My escape vehicle. Bought it just a few days before that final night when Phil came home drunk at 1 a.m., finally showed me who he was, finally let me know. His eyes were glittery, the way they were the first night we met back at our 20th high school reunion one year ago, that night when our classmates were dressed in their finest and Phil had sauntered in wearing a dirty t-shirt and faded Levi's. Just came down from the South Hills where I have a little mining claim, he had drawled. Seemed so casual so unlike the others impressing each other with how successful their lives had become. Phil was different, always had been different. Back in high school, he'd been the romantic and surly James Dean figure, leader of the hoods. I didn't know him back then, of course. I was one of the intellectuals, an elitist, Dick's girlfriend, girlfriend of the student body president. Dick knows Phil, though. I discovered this only recently, first from Phil and now from Dick. The two are ancient enemies, their mutual hostility stemming from the day Phil made Dick look like a fool. I have only a vague memory of that event, a memory joggled loose by Phil describing the scene to me, the way he told it to me with such relish. Twenty years later, and he's still basking in that old high school victory. I remember sitting there on bleachers in the choir room next to Dick. It was an historic occasion, the very first trial held for a student offense. As the new student body president, Dick had set up this student court, and Phil was the first offender, being publicly tried for smoking a cigarette in the boy's john. I don't remember the details. All I remember is swirling confusion, a sickening sense of embarrassment. For Dick, as Phil, acting in his own defense, turned the whole event into a hilarious comedy, cleverly and effectively bringing to a quick end Dick's new fascist institution. Weird. Their last names. Phil Lohman. Dick High. So perfectly descriptive of their characters. My life as a soap opera. I've been with the highest and the lowest, the best and the worst of my entire high school class. Feel like a dumb, unwitting pawn in some kind of deadly ancient drama that has nothing to do with me. Dick says he was horrified when he heard I'd gone off with Phil. Feared for my life. I do not scoff now at his attitude, nor at my other friends who were so worried, nor at the doctor, even my father. One might say I've been humbled, brought to my knees. Frankly, I'm grateful to just be alive. That last night, that night he came home drunk at one in the morning, drunk. Finally let me see him as he really was. I remember waking up suddenly to a loud voice within me, coming through clear as a bell. Center yourself, it commanded. You have one minute. Time slowed to a crawl, like a series of gongs, inexorable, inevitable. I distinctly heard first the truck door slam, then the outside door slam, 
the inside door slam, heard him walking slowly across the living room floor toward the bedroom, the door handle turning, his shadowy figure outlined from behind in light. By the time he sat down on the side of the bed, I was sitting up, utterly alert and calm, ready for anything. How can I describe the next four hours? Phil and I locked in mortal combat, all of it taking place on the psychic plane. He was drunk, mean, menacing, his eyes glittery. Those same glittery eyes I was so drawn to at our high school reunion. Wondering what made them that way. Fascinating. What did they remind me of? Couldn't leave him until I found out. My goal was to leave the house, get out of there that very night. His goal was to keep me with him, and he pulled out all of his guns to do it. Literally. All the big shot guns he normally kept in the bedroom closet. He brought them out one by one and sat there at the dining room table, caressing them one after another, staring at me. Finally, he was meeting my eyes, not to connect with me, but to take control. And I, in order not to be controlled by his stare, had to create and enter and hold open a psychic space that was more powerful than his efforts to control me. He was staring at me. His staring triggered something in me. Reaching deep into myself, I discovered a limitless energy. Bringing this energy forward, my eyes found his, locked in, began to stare him down. Now, in late 1989, I can say that those early morning hours in September of 1981 were when my life began, were when I finally began to take responsibility for my life, though I didn't know it then. It would be several more years before I would begin to see the patterns in things, the rhythms, the punctuation, before I would begin to isolate certain events as crucial timing devices in the gradual revelation of my soul's trajectory. <laughs>